Mark Selby, CEO of Canada Nickel, uh, advancing uh, the Crawford Nickel Project in the heart of the emerging Timmins Nickel District. Advancing it through to a bankable feasibility study, Mark. Uh, good to see you. I know you're on the road, um, so we better get diving into this because the internet goes. So um, give us an overall summary of uh, what the BFS tells us. Yeah, very, very pleased with where it landed. Again, we did it in just over four years from the fifth drill hole, about twice as fast as most companies uh, would be able to do. Uh, you know, bottom line, uh, two and a half billion dollar uh, in uh, after tax NPV, IRR of seventeen percent. Uh, that includes a critical minerals tax credit that we're getting. If you layer in the carbon capture and storage tax credit that we we've, we've got, IRR goes up north of eighteen percent and NPV uh, two point six billion dollars. Uh, we're now the world's largest, second largest nickel reserve. That's sulfide or laterite. We're the world's second largest uh, nickel resource. Um, we'll be the only chromium producer in North America, which is a critical mineral in both both Canada uh, and the United States. You know, and in terms of bottom line cash flow, in terms of what you're looking at, you know, for metrics, you know, over a 27 year peak period, and again, this is a 40 year mine life that we've got now in the feasibility study. We'll average uh, over 800 million EBITDA and over half a billion per year of free cash flow uh, for 27 years. All of that mining is there, but then you know the the other addition is you know we were targeting a million tons. We've ended up with a million and a half tons of CO two carbon storage per year, which would make us among the largest carbon storage facilities in Canada and in North America. So it's big. It's very it's, very big, it's right? Big. But along along with big comes big numbers. Um, yep. Not only in terms of the the output. In fact, just give us the output because I want to get into the money in a second. So yeah, what, what are you actually throwing off? Yeah, so peak period we're looking at. Uh, 48,000 uh, tons uh, of nickel per year on average over 27 years. That would make us the third largest nickel sulfide operation uh, globally. Uh, and uh, again, substantial amounts of palladium and platinum, cobalt as byproducts. And then we have a second iron chromium product um, that will be producing you know, well over uh, a million tons of iron per year and about 75,000 tons of chromium, which would supply about 15% of the North American market. So this is an important supplier of, of a range of minerals, um, you know, in, in North America. Right. Okay. So let's let's get in, let's get in some numbers, dollar numbers here. Okay. Yeah. Because um, this is going to require a big balance sheet or the ability to raise a, a, a lot of capital for the for the, for the capex offex. Um, yep. Obviously, yeah. I appreciate it throws off a lot of cash flow, three cash cash flow over you know, multi decades. But mm. you got to get it off off the blocks, right? So, um, yep. what does this look like relative to some of these other? projects out there because i'm looking at 0.22 nickel i'm looking at 41 percent recovery rates yep. you know i'm looking at a big capex so what do i need to know yeah so b basically all we're doing with crawford is what you've seen the copper industry do for the last decade you know they're basically you know the new other than stuff in the congo um the rest of the world's copper deposits are you know 0.3 to 0.4 0.5 percent copper you basically spend a couple billion dollars to build a big you know, open pit mine mill uh, operation, you know, that has 20, 30, 40 year mine lives. You know, we're taking the nickel industry where the copper industry uh, has already gone, you know, and the kind of metrics that we have here, both on the capital and operating side would stack up with what you would see in the Western part uh, of North America. Again, you know, um, engineering wise, you know, we didn't work with someone who just does studies. We work with a Senko who actually builds these projects. And so again, in terms of capital estimates, in terms of, of, of operating estimates, you know, th they deliver the kind of results where, you know, things end up on time, on budget, and actually ramping up ahead of, of the design capacity and the number of the projects that they've done recently. So, you know, we are on the path to get this built. We're already more than a third of the way through the federal permitting process. Uh, we expect those permits in 21 months. Uh, we'll have our financing package working with Scotia, Deutsche Bank, and Cutfield Freeman in place by the end of 2024, just in case those permits uh, show up early, and we expect to be in production by the end of 2027. We're the only large scale source of nickel uh, outside Indonesia that can get to market before the end of this decade. And we have OEMs, you know, and battery supply ch chain people banging on the door because they need literally, they don't need just one Crawford. You know, they would like to have four or five Crawfords just for the amount of nickel that they need in North America. You know, never mind Europe, 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 and elsewhere. And particularly given the massive carbon footprint. Uh, of, of so much of the supply in Indonesia, the fact that we're effectively a net negative 30 tons of CO2, uh, you know, for every ton of nickel we produce. Okay, but, but come, come back to the numbers for me, please, yeah. because I, I need to I need to understand. I get Osenko, 
one of one of the best engineering um, firms out there. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna use someone, it's like goes the go to, right? I get that. We know them, but they've looked at this and said, "Hey, Mark, a 0.22 nickel, it's good at 41 percent recovery rate. It's good. We we stand behind these numbers." Yeah. No. The key here, right, is we're basically just you know very fundamentally is you know. Over the life of mine, we're going to be mining rock that we get $28, you know, a value for, and we're going to spend about $11, uh, you know, a, a, a ton to mine it. So you're looking, you know, you know, in terms of very, very healthy operating margins, you know, over a 40 year period, uh, you know, that's the big benefit. You know, that's why BHP, Rio Tinto, Anglo-American, they don't buy, buy small high grade mines. They want, you know, multi-decade multi-expansion potential assets, you know, and this is exactly what we've got here at Crawford. This is what the car industry wants. That's what the battery guys want. You know, they're all going to be on this parabolic growth curve and they would like nothing more to be involved in, in a nickel asset that can expand along with their business expanding going forward. So, right. Okay. So would you, how would you describe, I know you described in your press release, this, this is, you know, robust economics. Is it, I mean, do you truly believe that? I mean, they, do these numbers stack up? Uh, in comparison to other projects like this, oh, I mean, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, our, uh, you know, all in sustaining cash cost in the first phase is less than three dollars a pound or sixty-five, you know, hundred dollars a ton over the life of mine. You know, we're in the lower part of the first quartile. You know, at, uh, you know, a, about twenty-six hundred dollars a ton. Why? Because again, in addition to the nickel, we produce byproduct cobalt, byproduct PGMs, and the byproduct iron and chrome product. You know in a North American market that needs new stainless steel capacity that wants low carbon steel transformation to happen, you know, and we've got one of the key ingredients in the right location to be able to make that, you know, low carbon transformation uh, yeah, happen. And so, you know, if, if anything, there's, you know, upside potential in terms of the value that we can see from that iron and chrome product versus, you know, what we have here. And when you look at the lowest cost, the highest free cash flow machine mines, because again, at the end of the day, mining, it's about you know, making free cash flow, not keeping geologists and engineers uh, employed. And so, you know, th th you know, th this, the, the assets in the nickel industry that are, are the best free cash flow assets are those assets, you know, that have that polymetallic, you know, big byproduct credit associated with it. And that's what we've got here at Crawford. Matt, I wouldn't like to be a, a pure plate cobalt company at the moment. Um, a lot of byproducts, a lot of byproducts uh, for for you and, and and others, I guess. Um, just okay. So, so coming back to um, you said like that there are people knocking at the door. Battery manufacturers want this kind of thing. Um, car manufacturers want this sort of thing. Are they the people who are likely to come in with their balance sheet and get this thing funded? Because obviously, if I'm a shareholder in your company and you're going out to look to raise a couple of billion bucks. Uh, in, in whatever mixture, blend of money, type of money um, that is, I'm going to get a bit nervous. So again, talk me through that bit. Yeah. So so again, in terms of the equity stack, you know, first off, uh, you know, again, with these with these projects are the tax credits. So when you factor in, you know, what we've included is in the base case is just the critical minerals credit. We expect to be able to qualify for the carbon capture and storage credit. That takes our peak capital um, down to 1.7 billion from the 1.9 billion dollars we need to build it, plus another 1.6 billion for phase two. We get two phases for 1.7 billion dollars just because of the amount of cash coming from the automatic tax funding that the government's going to create. We'll need about 800 million dollars of of capital, um, you know, to build that project. So, in terms of the government credit, the the automatic ones, you know, you've got a couple hundred million dollars plus. Uh, right there and a total of, of over almost a billion dollars over the first uh, seven years. Uh, we'll then have a bunch of one-off programs. The Canadian government has a strategic innovation fund. They have a critical minerals infrastructure fund. Um, and then the Ontario government also provides tax funding. So, you know, we're looking at, you know, we're looking at target government contributions of, of close to, you know, half or more than half of our overall equity check. In terms of the offtake discussions that we're having, you know, again, I can sell four times my production from Crawford. Um, you know, I don't, <laughs> offtake is, is not a worry. We know what we're saying to people is if you want offtake, when you sign that, we want a portion of the total capital you're going to provide upfront when we sign. So that'll help us bridge us from financing today to um, a construction decision in mid-2025. That's why we put that bridge loan in place, you know, so we've got the time to get a couple deals 
over the line. And we think, um, you know, we, we uh, we're in pretty good shape to be able to get one of those announced uh, before year end. Um, and then, um, you know, with, with that, that capital from them, plus the government, plus a small PGM stream, you know, we can, you know, construct a scenario where it's very unlikely that we'll actually have to come to the market you know, for any, for any equity uh, to get this project built. But are you keen to do this yourself? Because you could have a whole bunch of other Crawfords out there, right? Where you kind of want to kind of cookie cutter the heck out of this thing, surely? Oh, we do. No, I mean, again, Crawford is project one. Uh, there's no one on our team who thinks Crawford is the best project, you know, based on what we know from some of the other deposits we've already started drilling. You know, we think uh, there is a number of them that are potentially bigger and better uh, than Crawford. And yet, no, we, we, we are unlocking an entire nickel district you know, in a, in, a, in a global economy that's desperate for non-Indonesian, non-Chinese controlled, non-high carbon nickel. And, you know, so clean nickel in the right place that you can actually get it built is is what we have, um, you know, uh, what we have in Timmins. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, okay, well, let's let's see how that pans out between that now and this uh, Christmas, I guess. Um, so can we just come back to this 41% yeah. re- recovery rate, okay? It doesn't sound like a lot. If I'm a gold guy, I'm like going, well, it doesn't sound like a lot. I'm used to sort of you know, mid-80s, early 90s recovery. But for nickel, is that normal? Yeah, for these types of ultramafic nickel deposits, the geological reality is is the recovery is between 40 and 50%. You know, a- again, I know it's different than the high, small, high-grade deposits that you see in Western Australia or Sudbury, but those are small, high-grade deposits that don't have the kind of resource space. They have. If you look in other industries, um, you know, the recovery is just one number of an overall value equation. Again, it's how much revenue do you get per ton and what's the cost per ton to get that uh, material out there and how much capital do you need to spend to get those tons. It's no more complicated than that. If you look in the oil and gas industry, you know, if you get 30% of a conventional resource, you know, that's a shoot the lights out, you know, delivery in the oil space. If you get 10 to 15% of a tight oil play, again, shoot the lights out. On In brine lithium, again, you know, very low total recoveries in terms of the total lithium resource. So in the, with these ultramafic nickels, and again, these are the only, you know, potential deposits that can deliver, you know, the, the kind of scale of nickel that we need in the West over the next 10 years, 40 to 50% is the number. You know, that, that's what you're going to see, you know, time in and time out from these other deposits. And as long as the overall equation works, you should just, you know, it's just a number. Right. Okay. The, with the, with the current, current capture and storage that, uh, component, obviously, you, you know, moves you from 17.1% to 18.3%. So it's, it's, it's a meaningful contribution um, there. And how critical is it? Because, you know, it, it kind of feels like, you know, carbon capture is a very new thing. It's a very nascent thing. How committed are the Canadian government to that? How, com- how committed are their budget allocations to something like this? And do you need it if it all goes awry on that front? Oh, we don't need it. I mean, again, at the end of the day, it's a nice sweetener on top of, of the project. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, we've already had significant inbound interest from some very, very large North American players who are looking to position themselves as carbon solutions providers, you know, to, to their to their customer base. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, carbon storage in certain parts of the country is, is, is you know, is pretty critical. There's very few places where you can do it. Um, and the fact that we've got this mineral-based sequestration that permanently locks it away in the rock, um, you know, is a, is a pretty attractive uh, proposition. Uh, and uh, again, because we'll be uh, moving forward here very quickly, you know, we'll be in, in a good position to take advantage of of the credits and, and programs that are available today. Okay, so this is Crawford. Um, let's give us the, the what next for Crawford. I mean, it's BFS. It feels like okay, we're done here, apart from I guess the permits. Um, yeah. So how, how long is that going to take? Yeah, no, but just coming back to your earlier question, which I didn't answer around uh, basically developing it ourselves, you know, we're selling, you know, at the end of the day, we've got the team, we, we've made a number of appointments in the last last couple months here to really beef up the team to take it forward. Uh, I think the reality is, is uh, again, the majors are looking to expand, you know, into nickel. There's very few plays out there. You know, we are going to push as hard as we can to keep our share price as high as we can, because that's the only defense um, that we've got. And we'll see, you know, we'll see how things transpire in the next 12 months. In terms of milestones, um, we will have uh, the second stage of our permitting process is the impact statement that'll be filed mid-2024. Uh, the government is then on the clock for 365 days to come back with an answer. That'll be mid-2025. They've talked about shortening the process up, so there's a good chance you know that'll show up even earlier um, sometime during the first half of 2025. In terms of the financing package, uh, we'll be kicking off in November the formal process Scotia and Deutsche Bank um, and Cutfield Freeman. 
to get that financing package in place by the end of 2024. Again, we want to be ready in case the permits come early, you know, that we can we can get started earlier. Um, and with a mid-2025 construction date, we'll be first production by the end of 2027. And a good, a good three to four years, you know, faster than most of the other bigger projects out there outside Indonesia. Okay. So it's, it's a tight market out there. A lot of companies um, cash strapped, struggling, not quite sure what to do is going to make any difference um, to their business. Um, how, how are you for cash right now? And more probably, what are you, what are you doing with it? Yeah, so um, we, back in the beginning of September, um, we did a bridge loan with Lower Met. We've done that twice. We've bridged two events in, in, both, in both, both cases. Uh, you know, again, the timing and the quantum we need are what we need to keep the, the, the uh, project on track. So we're well funded now into early next year. So, you know, people don't think that, oh, just because we've hit a milestone, there's going to be a financing next week. That's, you know, not the case here. Um, and, you know, the, the key piece uh, is these offtake agreements. You know, in our back of our document, we've got our checklist of the various things we intend to accomplish um, this year. And offtake agreements are one of them. We're making very good progress on that front. You know, and our, and our hope is that we'll get one of these over the line, you know, before the end of the year, um, which then should take us give us a good chunk of the financing we need to get through till mid 2025. So, you know, uh, again, I know the market's horrible out there, but you know, we're, we're pretty, very confident and, and very happy with where we're sitting right now. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, look, Mark, I like, appreciate the run through um, with that. I'm sure you'll get a lot of feedback from the market and analysts and so forth the next few days and weeks. Um, so um, stay, stay in touch and um, we'll speak to you soon. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, sir.